All right, we'll open up the planning time. board meeting for April 12th, 2022. Um, this is being recording, recorded. Uh, if anybody's recording, you just need to let us know. Okay, it's being conducted via um, the hybrid manner, live and via Zoom per the general laws. Um, planning board members on Zoom? I'm gonna start saying it's on Zoom this evening. Okay, so no markers. No markers. That's correct. All right, uh, seven o'clock town planners report. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. All right, since the last meeting, I had a couple of meetings, uh, met with Mr. Jim Boyle, actually I spoke with him, I should say, uh, regarding uh, self-storage facilities uh, in zoning in South. Some of that discussion revolved around opportunities within the industrial restricted zone. Uh, and it also reflected upon the previous application that was withdrawn uh, for self storage because it was in the business, I believe, business district um, off College Highway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, let's see, I met with representatives from Lodestar Energy, uh, the operators and uh, uh, I should say applicants for the solar facility at Goose Pond. Uh, they are looking uh, to potentially expand the footprint of that facility. So, this is the one that's further away from uh, College Highway. Um, wanted to meet and show an informal plan, talk about uh, if it were zone lines lay in relation to the parcel and the remaining buffer um, around that property. Uh, there's some remaining uh, open acreage that I think they're looking to take advantage of, square off, and it's surrounded essentially by tremendous uh, areas of wetland. Is this the same company that did the one in the front? No, different from the one that's closest to College Highway. That's, I also met with Lori Scott Smith, uh, 21 Matthews um, Road. She previously uh, met with the former uh, town planner regarding uh, home occupation. She operates a, a spray tanning uh, business. Uh, that got put on hold during uh, COVID and she was just doing her due diligence uh, to come in, um, check with make sure nothing had changed on the planning side. Uh, so she intends to um, either continue or reestablish, I don't know which is the case, I heard business certificate locally and resume operation. Um, just looking at uh, upcoming uh, applications, uh, second meeting this month on the 26th, we'll open a subdivision application uh, for five residential lots, one open space lot and remaining acreage um, off of Hillside Road. And the only other item I have for that uh, at the moment will be our review for uh, acreage off of, I should say acreage, square feet off of uh, White Street, um, where there was a discussion um, regarding turnaround that the town uh, currently maintains, land of Congamon Heights Association, uh, and uh, a landowner on the opposite side from the lake that has been maintaining land there for some time. Uh, that came to a point of, we'll call it agreement uh, with the town through um, town council's uh, input. And so that will bring it to us for an ANR. Um, the last thing I'll notice is that we have a the main meeting, May 10th. I think there's a town event on that day. It's town elections. We have elections. Town elections on that day. So. I don't know if that poses a problem. I just wanted to raise uh, that for discussion. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, you can't raise an election day. Uh, there um, we go. What? I feel like we do this every year and we try to think about it and <laughs> then do it every year. <laughs> we just like to keep um, the shell on our toes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, well, it's uh, I, I'm leaving it to you because the chances enough? of me being at that meeting are slim. So, um, and the Tuesday before is voting day, right? The ninth is election, right? No, ninth is election, is it voting, and uh, 16th is a meeting, is that right? Uh, uh, the 10th, 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 Mm -hmm. Typically, right? Um, correct. Town meeting would be tough, right? And you can't have yeah. an election day, and town meeting would be tough. So, um, um, 
Is there anything that would warrant us having a meeting on the third? Not well, we that hillside hearing is going to be open, but like again, I'm going to be, I'm probably not going to be here on the third or the 10th or the 17th or the 24th. Possibly the 31st. <laughs> so <laughs> May is going to be tough for me. So right. I'll leave can it up we to you. Not, guys. Can we not do line up any meetings for that? Okay. My, uh, mm -hmm. my son being deployed overseas on the 6th. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be spending those four days with him before he goes. All right, hold on. Let me just pull not here, anticipated. So Mr. Sutton, not here. We have the 26th. Takes us one less scan. Um, That's our June day. You know? June 28th. Yeah, we shouldn't be having two June. All right, uh, my suggestion is going to be hold it on the uh, 26th and May 17th and then June 7th. So just to clarify, uh, 26th of April, uh, May 17th is uh, town meeting. Oh, shoot. Sorry. That's okay. 24th. 24th, yeah. Sorry. Yes. So we'll hold it on the 24th and then June 7th. Okay. Just want to make sure we uh, touched upon those um, dates. So... Yeah, April 26th, May 24th, and June 7th, and then I guess what the 28th. Yeah. That's the that's the intention. And one in July and one in August. That's correct. Okay. All right. That What's works. the date of the July? Uh 12th. Did you say April 27th? April 26th. 26th. Okay. Right. I, I may have okay. said that. That's okay. <laughs> Anybody, it's probably me. That was him. That was dead on. Um <laughs> All right, what about um, 101 or no? Um, sure, let's, uh, let's give an update on that. So sometime prior to my arrival in June, uh, the building inspector issued a, a citation, um, a fine to 101 Point Grove Road related to, <clears throat> to the lease of or the renting of boat slips, um, which we know is a problem because there's no off-street parking provided for that use of that site. Um, uh, towards the latter half of, I believe, last week, uh, we got an update that the matter had been, I'm going to use the term, dismissed. Is that the proper term? Um, over uh, to go to the we start that all over again. The officer representing the matter um, before the clerk uh, came back and reported that the fine had been dismissed, given that the, there was inadequate information about the parking and the zoning violation in the first place. So to that end, and not knowing to rent tremendous detail, on how that came to pass, uh, I we, we did briefly speak uh, with the police chief, and I think if the violation uh, continues into the future uh, and uh, the owner is cited again, I would likely attend alongside the building inspector um, to shed more light upon uh, the matter. All right. That's so, as something was, I only have a little bit of information. Apologies. Yeah, well, no, we'll try to get more information in the meantime. And there's also a new, potentially a new issue for the doc going in there um, that I don't know anything about other than it's been brought up. So um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this nonsense. So um, so we'll figure this out. And I mean, I, at a minimum, she doesn't have a use permit from us. She specifically is prohibited from leasing slips or from altering the dock in any way under their her chapter 91 license. Um, so, you know, it's just, I think, a matter of figuring out the steps. So, but this is, I mean, I've dealt with this, I think, on a yearly basis since I've been on the board. So, 
Um, and I'm sure it's been going on longer than that, but mm -hmm. since I've been on the board, that's eight years. So um, we'll figure it out, but that'll, I'm sure, be on the agenda going forward. Um, all right, anything else? That's it for me. Okay. Uh, 705 public comment. Uh, anybody have anything for the board tonight that is not on the agenda? We'll start with people in person. Okay, then we'll go to Zoom. Anybody on Zoom? I see you don't hands raised. Okay. Um, 710 159 Berkshire Avenue. Tell me about all extensive <laughs> sure thing. we have received updated uh, information essentially we have a review packet a series of attachments uh, submitted by uh, mr hale the engineer representing the application uh, he is uh, in attendance this evening and if he wants to give us a uh, a brief overview of the uh, I suppose the intention or the arc that this will uh, travel but at this point uh, Randy and I will uh, likely be sitting down to uh, walk through the application, review, um, and so we'll side by side with the original uh, comment letter. But we did get a decent amount of stuff in there. No, oh, yes, we've, we've got a, we have a review package. Um, That's what I understand. Okay. To that end, that review, that joint review may not be able to be concluded before April 26th, as I'll be out of the office next week. Don't tell me. Um, but as long as we're moving it forward and stuff has come in, that's fine. So it'll probably end up over on the May 24th, but that'll be plenty of time to review and move it sure. in the right direction. That's right. Uh, would you like to entertain some discussion for me? Sir? If he has anything to offer uh, or wants to summarize what's been submitted, he can certainly do some. Sure. sure. Uh, Fantastic. So uh, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, just a quick summary, so I can just rattle off a few things that came through. The, um, the application was started, submitted, uh, the letters, the correspondence going back and forth, the, the two or three site visits, um, phone calls, so different things to address. Prepared a uh, hydrology report for existing versus proposed um, on-site hydrology and off-site storm water that would contribute to the overall system. Um, looked at that, balanced out elevations and incorporated it into the design. So it came up with a working solution there. Uh, developing the stormwater management plan, I've submitted uh, a draft or it's a plan, we'll call it that. It's, it's a for review. There to be some additional comments for that and maybe a couple things to uh, include that I didn't think of yet, but. Uh, between the stormwater management plan, erosion control plan, operation and maintenance manual, uh, some inspection requirements are going to be included. And once all those plans are reviewed, uh, we'll probably be focusing in detail on the construction sequence part of it and uh, the details there, the construction details. So I'm, I'm sort of looking for more for those comments back now, and um, we'll we'll work towards towards the common goal here. Perfect. All right. Anything from the board? Okay. So, so um, there's nothing. I assume there's nothing else since we didn't actually have a meeting schedule for that. That's um, correct. So um, why don't we just put it on the same thing? Seven ten, May twenty fourth. And uh, yeah, um, do I hear a motion? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Dave Spina, aye. David Sutton, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. Stick out there? Oh, he is, I think. <laughs> He's muted, though. Hi. <laughs> Perfect. Is that an I or a hi? <laughs> Doesn't matter. We're taking it. We're taking it as an I. Um, all right. 
So that would go to 710 on the May 24th. Thank you. Um, can you just, um, what I've told Dick Pinnell in his, with his lake management hat on, is that um, if you see applications come in that may relate to the lake in some way, that you will not only forward the original one, but you think automatically goes over to them, but any subsequent things you get during the course of that year. Sure, not um, a problem. This so, is hot off the presses, but we'll get that uh, distributed yes. over to EPW and um, Yep, appreciate that. Um, okay, thanks, Derek. Very good, thank you. 715, informal discussion, 686 College Highway, uh, contemplated ferro gas, blue rhino reconditioning and refill facility for propane cylinders. Uh, Hi, Derek. Uh, Hello, sorry, if I, sorry if I spoke too soon, my apologies. It's okay, I'm not used to not having a computer in front of me, so it's throwing me off a little bit. Um, so, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, why don't you just introduce yourself and then we um, and, and start off with what you want to present and discuss and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Southwick, for um, letting us have your time this evening during your meeting. Uh, very much appreciated. My name is Christy Grego, and I'm the manager of real estate for Feral Gas Blue Rhino. And um, we're just gonna go through a brief um, introduction of our team that's working on this project. So Megan Sharp, if you wanna take it away. Thank you so much. And um, I do see that the, the host sharing is not available. Um, we did have um, an overall a presentation. I'm not certain if we're able to show that on here. If not, we understand. You are. Just give us one minute to adjust the security setting. Thank you. Thank you. Try that, Megan. Okay, perfect. Can you see that? Yes, thank you. All right. I'll start. I, I'm Jill Rhodes, Vice President of Production for the Blue Rhino Production Facilities. And I'm Megan Sharp. I'm our VP of Operations Support. So I oversee our safety team, our risk team, fleet, and real estate as well. And I'm Rufus Youngblood, Director of Safety for Feral Gas. Uh, good, good evening. I'm Josh McLeod. I'm the uh, Manager of Safety for Blue Rhino. I'm Brandon Stewart. I'm the plant manager in Tavares, Florida. And I'm Jim McGrath. I'm the plant manager in Hutchins, Texas. Good evening, Southwick. I'm Dayan Andrejic. I'm the general manager for the Blue Rhino Northeast Division, uh, responsible for barbecue tank exchange operations throughout New York State and all of New England. And we also have uh, Denny Mosier, who was unable to be with us uh, tonight for environmental, but uh, we, we just want to thank you for allowing us to be here and uh, taking the time overall for us to um, have this informal discussion with you. Um, this is just a brief overview of what we will cover, and I'll really review who we are and what we're all about, um, but this will be followed by our safety team with Josh and uh, Jill Rhodes, she'll present an overview of our production, as well as Brandon Stewart on the plant tour. But we just ask that if there are any questions or feedback, uh, feel free to uh, interrupt us, ask questions, or um, if there is availability in the chat, um, we, we can monitor that too and, and answer questions as well. Um, but you can see the, the pink right there, that pinkish color. and, and this really shows Southwick. And then around there is all of our current customer for cylinder exchange and bulk customers that uh, we currently uh, service that are, that are part of your community within Southwick and that um, we value as customers in the area. And so we were, Feral Gas was founded, Blue Rhino, in 1939 by AC Feral, and this was in Atchison, Kansas. So um, AC son, Jim Farrell, he is still our 
CEO today and heavily involved in, in our success. We have over 4,000 employees and we are the second largest propane company uh, in the United States. Um, we're all employee owners of Feral Gas and we really are a small family company with many communities across the United States that we take part in. Um, we have approximately 864 man locations and um, about 62,000 tank exchange locations. So um, we have about a million customers in all 50 states that we're serving. Uh, we do service different customer segments from residential, uh, industrial, agricultural resellers, um, and, and many other customers, tank exchange production just throughout the United States. So our structure is set up with feral gas as our retail component and Blue Rhino with our tank exchange and production. And we have Feral North America, that's our, our wholesale distributor, um, but we are very intertwined in all of our businesses. So this just shows a map of um, overall for Blue Rhino. So you can see the Blue Rhino production facilities, um, the Blue Rhino service units, as well as the smaller circles are our feral gas service units. And we have a few different independent production facilities uh, overall as well. And um, this map just shows our active owned properties and lease sites that uh, Feral Gas and Blue Rhino have across the US. So we currently manage just over a, a thousand owned properties across the US and about 600 lease properties as well. Um, but we're, we're heavily focused on our environment overall. And um, so you can see here, like within social, environmental and governance, um, we we do more and we're heavily invested. We, we are contributing in our local communities. Uh, Blue Rhino is now the sole provider of our Operation Barbecue Relief. And we provide 100% of support for propane for disaster relief and response um, that we move on quickly to ensure thousands of people have a meal with our mo with the mobile kitchens. And we participate in the International Rhino Foundation. Uh, we do have about 300 veterans um, and Air National Guard Reserve active duty employees, about 10% of our employees. Um, and we do have bobtails in the field uh, that are camouflaged, dedicated to the employees that have served our nation in feral gas. And I'm fortunate as a current member of the Air National Guard to have Feral Gas's full support over the last 16 years with the company deploying on a couple of occasions as well too. Um, and our new employees that start, they get an opportunity to contribute to an organization of their choice. And the Veterans Association has picked a lot. Uh, we also do Operation Warm. It's another initiative that we're heavily involved with in providing coats for for children in the winter and it's continued successfully over the years. But propane is really a great alternative fuel that um, better you know, overall than our electric partners. It's hydrogen rich, we use it for our vehicles and, and really good for our environment overall. Um, just here, we our, our, current, our company is currently taking part in Earth Day. So we have been since the beginning of, of April and moving through the next 10 days. So every employee is actively involved in some way or another. And whether that is picking up trash in our local areas uh, to our ESG, ESG tree initiative, where we're planting trees on several properties, uh, improving the environment when we can. Um, and even in areas where we have to cut down trees that we are ensuring that we are you know, planting more trees and keeping our areas um, beautified. But, our corporate locations of Kansas City and Winston Salem, we've taken part in the local community activities within Earth Day, um, and uh, just just a lot of overall things. And I've barely just touched on a few of the things that that we do as employee owners. But with that, I will pass it over to to Josh. But if there are any questions, we can take them now, just before we move on to the safety portion as well. Anything from the board? Okay. All right, why don't we move on? Okay, thank you. All right, um, good evening. I uh, appreciate the time to, uh, to share this evening. I'm gonna share just kind of briefly about the kind of the overall safety structure of Blue Rhino and our production facilities. Um, you know, safety is a part of, of everything we do. 
Um, it's kind of the, the glasses that we look through and how we, we see and interact with those around us. Um, as part of our safety structure, uh, first day on the job, um, new, new, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, new employees are required to complete first aid training requirements before they can begin work. Each, each uh, employee is required to attend monthly safety meetings that reinforce or refresh original safety topics for OSHA and DOT guidelines. And all of our training meets that OSHA and DOT standard uh, training requirements. Uh, our facilities are built to ensure the safety of the public, employees, and emergency responders. Um, each facility includes uh, fencing to create a barrier between the public and the product. In the event of emergency, we have the heat stops throughout the facility, which will shut down the flow of the gas at the bulk tanks to eliminate potential large release of gas. Uh, po uh, policies and practices are in place uh, for what to do in case of an emergency and how to respond to extreme weather conditions. Uh, we follow uh, NFPA, DOT, and local code standards and regulations for um, not only the, the building of our plants, but also for safety and security of the, the public around us. Um, continuing with, with safety as a part of everything we do, um, we also uh, comply with OSHA 1910-119 process safety management, and it's, it is a big part of everything that we do as well. Um, you know, I think some of you are probably aware that nine years ago, we had an incident at our facility in Tavares, Florida, which um, we had a large, large fire in the storage area of, of that facility. Um, the fire was contained to the storage yard only, and Blue Rhino responded immediately to make changes to identify threats and solutions. Um, we relied upon internal experts. We have a lot of tenure within our company um, and external experts to identify um, what needs to be done to ensure that we do not, we would not have a repeat. Impact. Some of the items that we have done in response to um, that incident in, in uh, Tavares um, was we beefed up a lot of our policies and procedures in, in part of our process safety management program. And I do want to tell you that PSM is, is an acronym that we use quite a bit within our day-to-day -day life, um, but it's something that is that we live and breathe on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, PSM encompasses 14 elements that focus on mainly employee safety, hazard analysis, training, and inspections. And this isn't something that just a program that sits on the shelf, but it's something that we are involved in. Each year we review all of our policies and procedures um, in relation to the plants and corporate policies and procedures as well. Um, some of the items that we updated after the incident in Tavares, we added three policies um, to ensure the safety around the plants. Uh, one of those policies was a product containment policy of what to do um, in case of a gas, you know, what, what are the steps that are taken in, a, in, the, in the event of a release, uh, either from the piping or, you know, if there's a leak with the, the cylinder in the yard. Um, also within that policy, we state that we are going to walk the yard on a consistent basis and uh, make sure that we cannot identify any leaking cylinders that may be in the yard or we identify them early. Um, we, we added a policy on storage yard guidelines. So how are we, how are we gonna store our product in the yard in, in a safe manner in relation to everything that goes on? In it? What are our setbacks from our offices, from our parking, from our um, trash, from just the production facility itself? And what are the, the distances between even the stored product? I mentioned that, that uh, the fire was contained in the storage yard. Um, and so one of the big steps that we did is we put six foot rows between every row of cylinders. So we, we spaced the product out as a, as a way to identify a potential hazard and eliminate it or reduce the hazard. Um, and we also included a traffic control policy. Um, who can come on the yard? Where can they go? Where do we park? Um, you know, we, we do our best to control the flow of traffic and interaction um, on the facility with, uh, with public, with vendors, and make sure that we are uh, interacting with everyone in a safe manner. We added a section to our process hazard analysis. Um, you can see there that we, every five years, we review our PHA. Um, and so we added a whole section just around the storage yard. And you know what, what potential threats are there and how do we mitigate those threats? What are our safeguards in place? Um, and so we, and we look at that every five years and we go through a process that takes um, the better part of a week of sitting down and just reviewing 
uh, what could happen and how do we protect ourselves from that, that particular incident happening. Um, so we have, like I said, PSM is, is, is a lot of, of what we do within our safety program, um, but we also have other programs in place to ensure the safety um, of the, the people that work for us and work with us. Um, <clears throat> we have a preventative maintenance program that's pretty robust and um, we continue to learn from it and how to better maintain our equipment um, and eliminate downtime. Um, as I view downtime, you know, we want to schedule it because when things happen uh, out, of, out of sequence or out of a timing event, um, that's when something, a potential issue could occur. And so when we schedule downtime, we have more, uh, more control over what's going on. Um, and we also have uh, an electrical inspection program where we invite the local electrician that works with the company to come out every year and review our, our panels and make sure everything's tight. And then every other year, we have somebody come in and do a thermography study where we have an infrared camera, take a look at all of our contact points within the facility electrically and identify any hot spots so we can um, resolve those issues before they become issues. You know, and, and we say that we do all these things um, and all these inspections and, uh, you know, internal and, and third party, but what good is it if, if we don't have follow through and follow up? So every third, every internal and third party uh, inspection, we create a cracked action plan to ensure deficiencies are correct and that we're, we're keeping up with that. And that's um, reviewed with the plant managers on a regular basis, either by myself or um, by the VP of production. Which, Jill, you want to take it away? Yes, I'll take it away. Thanks, Josh. Uh, one thing I would like to add on, on the, the three-year PSM program audits and also on the five-year process hazard analysis revalidations, those occur at every plant. So every year, Josh is doing about five uh, PSM three-year audits and about three process hazard analysis revalidations. And we also, it's not just the plant manager of the facility that's being audited. We'll bring in one or two other ones. So this is just a constant process. This is something that is dealt with every single day of probably the year. <laughs> so moving on to Southwick, um, we currently have 11 company owned production facilities across the country. We don't have a presence of our own in the Northeast. So Southwick, Massachusetts would be the largest on an annual basis volume facility. And that is projected to be at 4.2 million cylinders a year. As you know, from living here, the season is compressed. So about 65% of that volume falls between mid-April and August. We typically run four days a week, Monday through Thursday. We would look to do two 10 hour shifts with adjustments as demand calls for it. On the production side, we would need 50 full-time employees. And in the, in the peak season, we would need another 25 seasonal employees. And that is just on the production side. Um, on the distribution side, there would be another 25 or so that would, that would help getting the cylinders to the retailers and back. We estimate that we need about 25, um, sorry, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Does everybody hear me okay? Yep, yeah. sounds good. Yes. All right. So we, we anticipate that we need about 25 acres for this facility. It would have a 25,000 square foot production building. We would like to have another 10,000 square foot covered dock. On the storage yard, we estimate that we would have about 120,000 cylinders at any one time, and they would be in varying degrees of full or empty or needing to be refurbished. During the peak time, what we would expect the traffic to be is we would need 10 um, bulk propane deliveries a day, we would have 25 long haul trucks going out and we would have another 17 smaller route trucks going out. Dehan, would you like to add anything for the distribution side? 
Uh, no, uh, you, you've uh, you've touched on it. So um, our our delivery vehicles, what we use to send the product out to Lowe's, Walmart, Walgreens, all those customers that we have in New England, we use typically uh, a very similar configuration to what you see that Coca Cola and Pepsi use. They're, they are actually beverage body trailers with the roll up doors, um, and typically that that's the style of vehicle. Uh, we do not have any Jake braking on these trucks. Uh, they are all uh, uh, within a, uh, three years old. We don't use any older equipment, so there's no noise, no pollution. We've, we've mitigated all of that by ensuring that our fleets are constantly at least within the last three years of, um, uh, of uh, being uh, built and issued to us. So we're, we take a lot of pride in the safety and uh, appearance and operability of our vehicles and our assets that are on the road. Any questions so far? Are those numbers per day? Yes. Right. Have a sense of the, sh of the shift times, typically on, on other facilities? As far as when the beginning and end of the ships are. Yeah, well, let me let me give that to Brandon Stewart. He is up next. He's our plant manager in Tavares, Florida, and he has some not just his location, but he can answer some specific location questions, such as that one. So, Brandon. Right on. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Uh, typically, most of the locations in the United States start between 5 a.m. 6 a.m. Uh, for a 10-hour shift. And we usually, if it's an operation such as what we're proposing here with, with two shifts, we do put a little bit of, of a gap between the two shifts so that people can leave and another group of people can come in and it's not a congested state while they're trying to come and go at the same time. So it varies, like here in Florida, we start at 5 a.m. and we conclude at 3.30 p.m. and the second shift starts at 5 p.m. and concludes at 3.30 a.m. And it, it can vary, it's, but it's pretty typical. So here in Tavares, we have approximately 10 acres of, of land, see pictured here. Um, majority of the property is for the cylinder storage and truck storage that you can see towards the left-hand side of the picture there. And then our buildings are divided into uh, Two, one is a production building that's towards the lower part of the picture. And then the upper part of the buildings that is in the picture is what we consider a explosion proof building. It has, a, everything is done to a class one, div one standard. So that if there it was an event that there's a, a gas release of any kind that we would be protected from possible ignition sources. If you'll hit the next one, Meg. So everything for us, as Josh mentioned earlier, is a secure facility. This is our parking lot that is outside of the office in the building where a lot of the production steps are done. Everything is secured outside of this. Anyone that has access to the building would be an employee that has a unique gate code to get in an employee turnstile. Anyone else that's trying to get into the facility has to have access granted by someone at a, a secured locked door that we would allow them to come into the office. So we take it with a lot of seriousness about controlling the access to our property as we wanna protect our employees as well as the community around us. You'll go to the next one there, Meg. This is the other area that is an access point for trucks to come in and out. Just on the other side of the truck, there is a keypad that's similar to the one that was in the, the gate where the employee was going in. They have a unique code to get in. The gate allows the person to come through. Once the truck is through, the gate shuts behind them so that there's limited access to only those that have the codes to get in. Go ahead to the next one. And then, as they were mentioning earlier, the storage facility. All of our cylinders are stored in boxes to where that we can know that they're properly separated and that they're properly stored. We use a FIFO system to make sure that the cylinders are rotated through in a first in, first out 
basis. As cylinders come back, we want to utilize the ones that came back first in the, the production operation. And the ones that are completed, we want them to go out in the same order so that we make sure that the, the cylinders are going out in a uh, environment that it's not going to get to the consumer and have dust, dirt. It, it's going to be cycled through in a, a, a orderly fashion. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, as Joe was mentioning earlier, the bulk propane deliveries. This is a picture of a truck making deliveries to us. We typically here at peak will go through about six loads a day. And at the facility there, they're talking about 10. Um, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes for a truck to make a delivery. And they'll deliver us about 9,000 gallons of propane at a time. So once the cylinders have been brought back to our locations and put into the storage yard, they're brought up and you kind of see here, it's just the cylinders are stored on plastic pallets and dividers so that the cylinders can be safely uh, stored to be transported. The plastic has uh, an impression made into it to let the tank foot ring and the, the collar of the cylinder nestle into place. So it locks in and the, the cylinder is secure on that plastic pallet. Uh, our employees would take it off of these pallets, put it on a conveyor system to go through a, a production process, which would vary. It, every cylinder gets washed. Then it's gonna be something that a, a person would decide what needs to be done to the cylinder. Does it need a fresh coat of paint? Is it rusty and neat to have the paint removed from it so it can have a fresh coat of paint if it's acceptable? It could need a new valve. So we have safe equipment to remove the gas from the cylinders to where we can replace the valves, remove the paint, or if we deem that the cylinder can no longer be used, we punch a hole on the side of the cylinder so that it can never be used again before we place it in a, a bin to be recycled. As Meg mentioned earlier, we're very big on making sure that we're as green as possible Anything that cannot be used in our production process, the, the cylinders that are no longer usable, the valves, everything is recycled that is recyclable. A lot of our stuff comes in, the cylinders that are in the far corner of the picture here are new cylinders. They come in shrink wrapped and they have cardboard dividers. We send the cardboard out to be recycled. Once the plastic dividers are no longer usable, we send them out to be recycled as well. Basically, the only thing that goes to the landfill from our facilities is, you know, household consumable trash. It's very little that goes unused and recycled. So once everything is completed with the refurbishment of the cylinder to make sure that it's ready to be filled, it's going to come to this piece of equipment that we call a carousel. The cylinders are put on automate automatically the person connects a filling device to the cylinder once it reaches the target weight of the what's on the label of 15 pounds the cylinder automatically is disconnected and it's removed from the carousel automatically to finish the process and go back outside where we saw that previous picture where they were taking the cylinders off the pallets that's the same area that they would also stack them back up so that we can put them out in our storage yard to allow it to set to be sent out to the consumers. So Josh mentioned earlier that Tavares is unfortunately had an event nine years ago. I was the acting plant manager at that time. And we just want to let the community know as well as you all, I do, that if we don't take safety seriously, that I would not be here to this day. Um, for me to live that event and probably say that it'll be one of the most horrifying events that I've had to deal with in my life or hope to ever have to deal with again, if I didn't feel that the company took it seriously and wanted to make sure that we were doing everything correctly, there's no way that I would stay here and risk my life uh, when I have a family that I, I enjoy going home to every night. And we feel the same way about our employees. We want to make sure that they leave here 
safe and happy every night when, when we go home. But I thank you for the time to, to let me show you a little bit about what we do. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so with that, we will take um, any, any questions, feedback that anyone has overall um, from any of the presentation. We just really appreciate the time. All right, so let me um, first open it up to the board if they have any questions, comments, anything that they wanna know. Um, just one for me for now. Um, the, I think you mentioned a 10,000 foot dock I assume there's also impervious surface, which would be, you know, parking places for the employees, trucks, everything else. Do you have a sense of how, how big of a total impervious surface paved, if you will, or whatever would there be? Well, we estimate 25 acres, including the, including the buildings. So in total, it would be about 25 acres. Like uh, any other board questions? Mike. Yeah, Dick, go ahead. Uh, you said that you wash these tanks. How much water do you anticipate using? How many gallons or how do, and is the water recycled or what happens to it? Good question. Our, our washing device, it has about a 500 gallon uh, storage tank and the water is con it's reused all week. And typically at the end of the week, we would drain the water uh, different locations in the United States uh, handle it differently depending on what the local requirements are. Um, but about between 500 and 800 gallons a week is what we use for the washing of the cylinders. Uh, that would not include, you know, normal water usage for employees or restrooms of that nature. You also said that some tanks get repainted. Will you be having a paint facility? Like a paint booth or paint building or? Yes, uh, we have, each facility has a paint system that put, you know, applies a fresh coat of paint to the exterior of the cylinders. We use a water-based paint so that it has a very low VOC so that we're not trying to um, put it, we're trying to put as little out as possible to make sure that we're good stewards of the environment. Paint area is a self-contained building, is that correct? I mean, won't be any overspray out? Correct. It is in a self-contained paint booth um, that we clean most places, depending on the, the production. Uh, like here in Florida, we clean it multiple times a day to make sure that it's being, you know, handled properly, as well as a thorough cleaning at the end of each shift. Okay, thank you. For, for reference, I'll add that the Tavares facility does about 3 million per year on an annual basis. And so it's it's pretty close to the size that we would be looking at in South Lake. Any other board questions? A um, couple that I had, one, I just missed it. I'm sure you said it. It's Is it seven days a week that you guys are running? No. So I did six days a week. What are you running? Typically four days a week with maintenance on, and that's the production side. The production side runs um, typically Monday through Thursday with ma with Friday for maintenance or any kind of overflow activity, but distribution does go out. I don't, Dehan, is it seven days a week or is it six? So, yeah. So uh, between the months of mid-April to uh, end of September, we do run seven days a week. We do run uh, delivery operations. Uh, the remainder of the months, uh, we, we typically run five or six days, depending on, on the area and the needs of our customers. But we're, we're usually closed on Sundays in the winter and, and uh, in most areas on Wednesdays as well. Wednesdays seem to be a real, real slow month. Um, consumer behavior uh, around our product uh, buying pattern, patterns tend to be heavy between Friday and Sunday when, when people are home and they're off and, you know, they're firing up their barbecue grills. So with that in mind, um, the calculations about the traffic with the 10 trucks and the 25 long haul and the 17 route trucks, um, is that sort of at a peak um, with expected less depending on you know, seasonal or, or day of the week? Correct. 
Um, that is that would be the peak peak. And in the in the valley, the lowest valleys, it would be about half of that number. Um, if production is not running, it's not likely that we would have any LP deliveries, liquid propane deliveries. And the number of um, long haul trucks or route trucks that go out on the weekends, it, as Dehan said, it just depends on what the volume demand is. So it's it's not likely to be that every single day. So is it, am I correct in saying the 10 um, truck, the, the propane trucks would be four days a week? Yes. Um, and the long haul trucks, it, it sort of depends on, on what's accomplished, I guess, during those four days of production. Um, and probably the same with, well, route trucks are probably more regular, um, I would assume, but maybe not if it's if not delivering on Sundays or something like that. Yeah, and, and our route trucks, uh, our, our drivers typically leave uh, our depots around 7 a.m. and they're back anywhere between 3 and 5 p.m. So there, there's, there's, you know, during, um, during those delivery times where we may have five, six, eight drivers out on the road delivering, uh, they're back before rush hour uh, in most cases typically. So that minimizes any noise pollution or, or, or any traffic congestion in our local communities that we work in now. Um. And then uh, I just want to touch on, uh, get a better sense of some of the, um, what's being used for the reconditioning uh, process. I, we all, you talked about what the paint is being used, but as far as removing the paint, as far as reconditioning them in any way, what, what chemicals or what other products are being used in that process? Um, so we have a machine that uses a silica sand to remove the rust and paint from the, the cylinders. And then the dust that is created from that is properly disposed of in, in guidance with whatever the local requirements are. Each facility that we have in the United States has a little bit different um, constraints depending on what state they're in or what municipality. Um, but so as far as... I'm sorry, but as far as, as far as the other stuff, you know, the paint and the, the silica sand, uh, everything else is pretty much just the the normal water that is has a uh, degreaser put in it to help cut off the grease that possibly could be on the tank uh, from being under your grill. And the machine removes the valve, the gas. So everything is contained to really a few things. Uh, it's it's not really chemical based. It's all labor based. And the sandblasting and the um, the painting are all done in contained areas in the in the facility. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, town officials. Any town officials have any questions or comments? Okay. If I may. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the plan uh, at this site is to occupy roughly 25 acres for this facility. Would you mind expanding uh, if there are any plans at this time for the remaining acreage? At this time, we, we don't have any plans for the remainder. Do you have a, a sense on the property as to where it's going as far as the orientation of where this is going to go on the property? Um, we haven't done any kind of official drawings with any kind of engineering firm so we don't really know the quality of the, the actual land. If, if it was ideal then being able to utilize the corner you know have part of it in the corner of um, college and um, so, um, the, the other that other road there. Yeah. yeah. So that's not. I can tell you now that that's not going to happen. Only because there's wetlands in that corner, um, a significant way fronting on College Highway and and onto Tannery a little way. So 
I can tell you that that corner is is going to be off limits um, <laughs> now. Um, you just know that wetlands. <laughs> oh. um, it's a, it, I, I forget how much it is. It's not a huge for the size of the parcel. It's not uh, a significant amount, but there are some in that front area. Um, okay. Um, uh, public questions uh, for uh, the folks who are here tonight. So why don't we start with the folks who are in person first? Anything? I've got a series of questions. Why don't we, um, Cindy, why don't you ask a couple and then let me take some from Zoom and then I'll come back um, if you don't mind, just to sort of let everybody go. Okay, uh, Inga Hotelling. Or Inga, I'm sorry, why don't I say Cindy? Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I, I have a couple of questions for Josh and it's in regards to the safety component. Um, I'd like to know, Josh, what type of fire suppression you have at these locations? The, the fire suppression, uh, would, it kind of varies per plant and what local uh, regulations um, require. Um, we have, and maybe and Brandon might be able to speak to this a little bit as well, but we have some locations that have um, a sprinkler system. That's, and that's really where most of our locations fall under is a sprinkler system requirement, um, but not all due to the, the build or the location. So there's a possibility that here in Massachusetts, you wouldn't require to have a fire suppression system? Oh yeah, well, it's over 7,500 7, square feet. By law, you have to have it. Right, so I'm just surprised they didn't know that they needed to have that. They're still in the investigation stage. Okay. Um, in regards to the facilities, is there a full-time um, EHS professional on staff? Is there, I'm sorry, is there a full-time EHS yeah, professional? Right, is there a full-time EHS professional on site during both first and second shifts? Um, we don't actually manage, have a EHS professional like as a uh, titled position within at each facility, um, but I work very closely with, with all the plant managers and make sure that we have compliance and, and safety uh, structure and, uh, and firm foundation at each, at each location. Okay. And in the Northeast, since you've identified this region as being one of high usage, why have you chosen Southwick, which is a very rural farming community, and you're actually surrounded by farms, why have you chose this location? I can, I can add in on that too, overall. Um, I, I mentioned it a little earlier, but we are in smaller communities overall, and that is where we really prefer to be vested in the communities overall. Um, so Southwick, when we were, you know, going through overall, it just because we are in the community already within our feral gas footprint uh, for our operations and cylinder operations, um, but seeing a lot of the items that fit overall and there was a question asked about like, what else would be done with the property? And at one of our other locations in Hamptonville, there is a whole area there where we have trees that haven't been touched and we have left that as it is natural for the community. That way um, it's, you know, there's still areas in there where um, it's kept the way it is for environmental purposes. And uh, we believe in that for our locations as well. And um, yes, there, there is a property there, but doing everything we can, um, that's within our control, just to make certain that those locations, you know, we're, we're keeping up with, um, you know, local areas. But for us, um, we, we are employee owners, we all are. And the, the smaller communities and some of the larger communities overall um, do not have some of the same, I guess, overall uh, same philosophies that we have as well. And we would prefer to be vested in a community that's also vested in, in us as well. Like we're bringing jobs, you know, to the area and we want to make certain that those people that are in the community as well, that we're helping them and that it's, you know, both of the, the employees and us are really working together. And I think 
we tend to find that in some of those areas overall, the smaller areas that are, you know, vested in the local um, businesses in the area. And yes, yeah, so you, you may say we're, we're a large company, but we, we truly are smaller. And a, debating, you know, the, the size. Let me, let me just pop into some of the Zoom questions so that we can let everybody get in and I'll certainly come back to you. There's, you don't have time to do it. Um, so uh, anybody on Zoom, if you can use the raise hand function, great. If not, uh, the end will sort of open it up, but is there raise hands? It's not yet. Okay. Um, if anybody's having any issue, just you can pop on and say you have a question, just gonna make sure you identify yourself. Okay, Inga, it's back to you. Okay, um, I know you've been talking about your safety record and how much time and resources you put into the training. And I know that your last incident was in 2013, but do you believe as an employee owned company that's best to share um, best practices with other propane companies because within the past two years there's been four explosions within the northeast and i would think if you're so committed to what it is you're doing that you would probably offer yourself to share best practices with these other propane companies um, so can you speak about your involvement with sharing those best practices um, I'll jump in there. I'm Rufus Youngblood, Director of Safety. I, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, there was a question earlier about EHS personnel on site. Um, all of our managers have, are, are trained to, to act as EHS professionals when, when they're on site, and they all have the authority, any employee has the authority to raise questions or, you know, do, do whatever they see as, you know, as the right thing when it comes to safety items. Um, as far as the the, the events that you're speaking to, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the actual explosions or fires that you're talking about, but you know, I can I can I can say, with all honesty, the Blue Rhino safety team and the management team are second to none. They have multiple years of experience, and the, all, all the policies and procedures that Josh was talking about earlier, you know, that's it, it's really that's what they do, and they do it very well. Do the communities that you currently reside in, do they have full-time fire departments or are they partially um, part-time slash full-time? Are you referring to the, to the Blue Rhino plant locations? Yeah, the similar locations to what you're proposing for our community. Um, yep. Do those communities have full-time fire departments? Uh, Brandon, you wanna jump in there? I was gonna jump in there. I I've had the opportunity to run uh, different locations, and some of the locations have uh, full-time fire departments, such as here in Tavares, and some of the locations have volunteer fire departments. Uh, but the one thing that we do is we have uh, constant contact with them. Anything that needs to be updated, anything that they need to know, we bring them in, let them see the facilities, that way they're comfortable if there was something that they needed to come on site with, whether it was a medical emergency or uh, unfortunately like the event that I had to deal with here nine years ago, that they're familiar with what we do and what they need to do if they had to come on site. So it doesn't matter whether it's volunteer or full-time paid, uh, we have both. That's awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one, I see one online, someone's raising their hand. Hi, uh, David Real, 84 South Long Yard. So in that Tavares fire, uh, what were the resources that the full-time fire department had to respond with compared to what might be available to us with our volunteer department? And also on the infrastructure question regarding the trucks, we really don't have the infrastructure in town for that many trucks. I know you mentioned you want to be vested in small town communities, but I didn't think that adequately answered the question asked about why, why a small town when we don't have the infrastructure. Thank you. So your first part of the question was as far as what resources were needed to make sure that 
we have a, a good working relationship to what's needed for our safety and the community safety. Um, a lot of the, the, the locations that have volunteer fire departments, it's just simply uh, normal fire trucks and the water mains that we have, fire hydrants, sprinkler systems, uh, and just a general knowledge. Uh, each facility has to submit a tier two uh, report annually so that the different uh, agencies know how we store our product, where it's stored at, um, so that there's a good working knowledge, even if they've never been on site. Uh, the information is right there at the uh, disposal for whoever's coming on site. I, I guess my question was more along the lines of what what type of resources were needed for, the, you know, maybe I, am I mixing up the Texas fire and the Florida one or um, possibly, what was required? Yeah, possibly here, the, the one in Florida was just in the cylinder storage area. So it did not come into the building. It did not have anything to do with the operational equipment or the process that we do. This actually was just out in our storage area where the cylinders were consumed by a fire, which is what Josh was talking about earlier. We've expanded the spacing that we put in between the, the rows and pallets of cylinders so that we could possibly prevent any spreading if something were to ever happen at any of our facilities again. Uh, we weren't prepared for that to, to be that easy to spread between pallets. And that's one of the, the changes that we've made to make sure that it shouldn't happen again. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess my question, and I know we're gonna get in the discovery phase, but is Southwick adequately staffed as a first response with our current fire department to prevent that from getting out of hand or not given that it's not a full-time staff department? Right, and, and I'm gonna say probably it's too early to tell. Um, we haven't really even gone beyond the, the, the basic start of the process. Yeah, and that would certainly be, you know, when, if there's an application that gets put in, it would certainly go over to the fire department um, and they would offer their comments as far as, you know, uh, what they thought about the plan and their ability to, to deal with the contingencies. But is there anything you wanna add? Would be good? <laughs> that would be something we would need to investigate <clears throat> and you know your fire chief is very welcome to um, reach out to the fire chief and uh, and Tavares and you know we've got a really good relationship there as we do with all of our other facilities and um, you know our production facilities in numerous states so more than welcome. I'd like to add also that uh, part of this process in building a facility like this, um, the NFPA 58 code requires a fire safety analysis to be performed. And part of that fire safety analysis is just that, to, to uh, recognize the amount of storage, um, the, the components are involved when, and get and receive input from the fire department um, as far as you know, what their capabilities are. Um. Any uh, other public questions? I don't know if I see anybody else on Zoom, but is there anybody else on Zoom who has anything? Oh, Andrew, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Andrew Gale, Quick Road. Road. Uh, where are you getting the, uh, what facility are you using right now to service the Northeast that you want to put this one into replace or consolidate? We contract with two different independent production facilities um, in Delaware. One of them is in Delaware. So the current, the current uh, product that we get at the corner store is delivered from Delaware up to a distribution center up here somewhere? Likely. Likely or don't know? No, likely there's, we, we have that independent. We also have another independent in Pennsylvania and there is a cylinder shortage that for the past couple of years. And so for the past two years, there has been product delivered to the Northeast that actually came from Hamptonville, North Carolina or Walton, Indiana. 
and then it's put on delivery trucks somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where is that taking place right now? For the Northeast? Uh, for Southwick. For Southwick. Um, that, Dehan, that's, that's, that's an independent, right, Dehan? Yeah, so so this the uh, any any uh, distribution that we do to your local stores in your communities comes out of our Springfield, Massachusetts depot, which the product comes from Dover, Delaware. Uh, we do have a depot in Epping in, in Maine as well, and in, in New Hampshire and Maine. And some of our product actually comes from one of our competitors uh, that has a production plant in Northfield, Massachusetts. A very small production facility, but nonetheless, uh, to to mitigate costs, we we do uh, contract out to a Northfield, Massachusetts production facility for a, a good portion of our product for New Hampshire and the state of Maine. But uh, yeah, so we we do we do deliver to Southwick, and it and it all comes out of the Springfield Depot. Those are where the drivers are coming from. Yeah, the Springfield Depot is a Blue Rhino facility, or is it somebody else? It's a Blue Rhino facility. It's it's just a depot. We have uh, storage. Uh, we store our cylinders there. Uh, we have uh, uh, everyone in that area is from the local community. We have forklift operators that load the trucks, unload the trucks, and we have drivers that come in every day and deliver the product and return to the same depot at the end of the day and return home. Where exactly is that location in Springfield? On Page Boulevard, 1709 Page Boulevard in Springfield. And there's no real estate around that geographical area that would accommodate this 4.2 million cylinder storage facility, facility? We, we've looked in the past, not with the acreage that we need, not with the natural buffers that we're looking to put in place and the, uh, the open space as well. Um, you know, when, you're, when you talk about, you know, Aguam or Chicopee or Springfield, it's so heavily populated right now, you, you, it's difficult uh, to get properties in those areas that will fit our needs. And um, those of you that have lived up here for most of your lives know that we've looked at the old Monsanto facility. Um, you, you can't touch those properties. They're so contaminated. And, you know, we, we just don't want to get into a situation where, you know, we're going to start stirring up, you know, a mess that someone else has made years ago. And it's, you know, sitting dormant right now. Um, again, we, we always look to be good stewards in our community. Um, what, one of the things that we do for all of our communities in Massachusetts, uh, since January 1st of this year to the first week of this month, We've already picked up at local uh, Department of Public Works and uh, uh, in many towns across the state of Massachusetts, over 10,000 uh, scrap tanks and we do it free of charge uh, so that the taxpayers don't incur a cost for their towns to, uh, to uh, eliminate that waste and uh, for it not to go into landfills. So we take all that steel back to our facilities and we send it back to uh, those that are refurbishable go back to production plants and those uh, that cannot be, uh, we send the scrap back to, uh, to a recycling company. Another question? Sure. Um, since 1939, have you ever had to close a facility that was production focused? Um, have you ever had to do that in your history? Yes. I'm going to ask if you know what kind of remediation process you have um, if you don't want Monsanto's facility because there's going to be so much work to be done to it. Um, if you were to come here and say the propane business tanked, no pun intended, um, what kind of remediation would we be stuck with? None. There's uh, Propane is non-toxic. Propane is non-toxic. And unfortunately, Denny Mosier cannot be on this call today, but yeah, propane does not, is not a contaminant. Once, it, once it's released, it's, it dissipates. Andrew? Uh, 
within the last year, you also made a preliminary presentation to Bloomfield, Connecticut uh, Economic Development uh, Commission. Uh, what was the reason that was dropped? Wetlands. Wetlands. <laughs> As far as building up on that site, so um, so you but, couldn't get twenty five acres there on that site, and and specifically there were vernal pools on that property. Oh, is that okay? Gotcha. Um. All right. Any other? Hi, uh, Cynthia Marshall, forty five Coast Hill Road, which is about a half a mile from this property. How many gallons of propane will be on this site on every day? Considering the empty tanks, your full tanks, the 9,000 gallon bulk tanks, how many gallons is going to be sitting um, on that property every day? I'm going to estimate about 180,000 gallons. I'd like to add in there, as far as the bulk storage uh, components on the property, um, you know, those those large bulk storage tanks are built with uh, many safety components in mind. They have uh, they have fail safe primary valves that that, that fail closed if there were ever were an event. But there are you know there are multiple safety features on the on the bulk storage facilities. But it's not the bulk ones that um, blew up in Travis. It was an employee um, accident that happened. And unfortunately, there were five at least critically injured people down there. And it was an employee error that caused that. And the forklift was not OSHA approved. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not talking about the bulk tanks exploding. I'm talking about the five gallons and smaller tanks were the ones that were caused three and a half billion dollars worth of damage. That was my, you know, that's why I was asking the total that was going to be down there. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so just to give you folks, and it, it certainly hop in at the end of this if there's anything else you want to add, but um, just to give you a sense of where things stand, I wanted to give you a bit of the landscape um, of where things are in the town um, because there have been some, you're sort of coming in in the middle of some potential changes to um, the, the process, uh, which you may or may not be aware of, I don't know. but. Um, we recently, so um, as you may or may not know, there was a proposed facility uh, on that property for last year, uh, a Carvana facility that was going to go on there um, on about 60 something acres there. Um, and that was withdrawn um, over the summer. Uh, since then, we've dealt with some process issues for these larger development uh, applications. Uh, we recently recommended to town meeting um, a process for major development applications, which years would certainly fall into. Uh, we can certainly get you a copy of what's being proposed. It's not gonna be voted on until um, May 17th, 17th. May 17th. Um, but, you know, and I, it strikes me from this conversation here today that what you see in there may not be um, atypical or something that you folks think is unusual to do. It, it, you know, it talks about having a community meeting and sort of being able to answer questions for the community before the application goes in um, and providing some sort of more information up front so that it's, it's available and then there's less sort of uh, continuing out the hearing. Um, and asking for more information as we go along. It's just sort of front-loading where the information comes from. Um, so, you know, 
we'll certainly get you a copy of that. Um, I don't know if it's going to pass town meeting. I don't, uh, in all honesty, know the law as to when it goes into effect after it's passed uh, at town meeting. Um, but, you know, it's something that I think if it does get passed at town meeting, I would encourage you folks to sort of follow along with and, and comply with the process. I think it's a good process and it would certainly help the board in evaluating the application if it does come in. Um, I don't know where you are in the process. I don't know if it's if it's weeks or months or however long you know you're anticipating to to uh, potentially put in an application. But just so you know that that's on the on the horizon um, and that's the the structure that you're coming into. Um, nothing else. I don't think with this with the process. Um, no. Okay. So. All right. Um, is there anything else that you folks had questions about or wanted to add? Nothing. Uh, and I, I mean, the app, the, the, the folks from Feral Gas and, and Blue Rhino, um, anything that you, uh, any <laughs> questions you have for us or anything else you wanted to add to the presentation before we wrap it up for tonight? Do you have anything? No. I don't have anything else. I just wanted to, to thank everyone again for uh, the questions overall, the feedback, and um, as I mentioned, we um, we care about the communities we're in, and and that's something that we take very seriously with um, those employees and those in the area. So we appreciate everyone's time and for allowing us to be here this evening. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, you know, certainly um, be in touch with Mr. Goddard here. Uh, you can he can direct you to the right folks to speak to um, and help arrange for any questions that you have in the meantime. Um, but otherwise, thank you for your time today. Thank, thank you. you for your time, Southwick. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. I'm still technically on time because we don't have anything else time. Um, <laughs> all right. Design. So discussions. Um, Noble Ski Crossing Subdivision request to release remaining lots from covenant in lieu of bond, posting a performance bond for remaining work. Um, is there someone coming on this or is there not coming on this? Uh, it doesn't look like anybody this particular evening, so I'll give okay. a brief update. Sure. Uh, that works best for everyone. So, um, Salt Marsh Brothers Construction Incorporated has submitted a bond in the amount of $600,000. Uh, performance bond for the remainder of uh, construction, the roadway and infrastructure over at Noble Street Cross. And that number was arrived at um, through, uh, I'm going to say a number of meetings, but if you will, at least some exchanges between uh, Randy Bundy, the director, uh, and Jesse Saltmarsh uh, as the developer. Uh, so that has been provided for review. Um, by town clerk for form and assurances in terms of its uh, life span, if you will, uh, how it is renewed, when it is, when the contract or the developer is relieved of that responsibility. Um, so this bond would allow for the developer to release the remaining lots that are held in the covenant in lieu of said bond. Uh, this has also been submitted to town council. So before you, I think you have a copy of the cover letter. Um, they have the latest release, Randy Brown's um, evaluation uh, estimate. Um, and a copy of the bond that was submitted. Um, Legal has requested some changes to the form, or at least some, uh, we call it, uh, Information to be added in the uh, we'll call the modifications uh, section. As I think you see, you'll see, this bond is really uh, the language is geared towards a an owner, if you will, and a contractor, uh, which is a different relationship than the town has with the developer. Uh, we're not bearing the cost. Uh, so, so there, <coughs> I submitted probably a half dozen or so uh, changes to Mr. Saltmarsh uh, for him to. 
the work of his attorney and the bond uh, provider. Uh, so update, and we look forward to seeing that. Oh, pretty much on hold. That's right. I think I think when we do get that, let me put this way. Just say it's on hold. It's okay. <laughs> the when we get the revised document back, I'll send that back out mm -hmm. to town council and make sure that the points uh, the adjustments meet the, their expectation as well. Um, anybody have any questions generally about the sort of construct of it or what? What they're planning on doing. All right. Um, only thing I would, have, Randy, you were. I think the number kind of came from you, or you were involved in it. Um, the only thing that sticks in my head right now, um, which we'll get to later, is um, the ranch issue and the sort of quality of construction um, and the sort of costs that may arise from that. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering whether um, you know, what, what checks have been in place or where, where does it stand right now as far as comfort level or confidence with the quality of what's been done such that it's not, you know, we don't get in a situation where it's not only that you have 500 something thousand left at work, but then you also have whatever for, for correction. Yeah, so there was a buffer, right? My number was about five hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and my my total thing, I just bought the six hundred thousand dollars in bond, and that was part of it. You know, just there are some things that may need to be corrected uh, before the project is turned over to them. So that kind of the, that is a little little buffer in there. Uh, okay. Hopefully, as he works forward and, and does more work, you know, that you know, he won't need six hundred thousand dollars. That'll be. I, I'm pretty confident that six hundred thousand should, should cover everything that we need to be done. Okay. I have I have considered that question. It's a good question. Um, but I'm confident we will just that we have progress. All right. So we'll put that on for the next meeting and hopefully have an answer from legal at that point in time. Um, yeah, okay. All right. All right. Um, next is uh, New England Disc Golf Center, 4151 John Mason Road. Requested minor site plan modification. So, Andy, you can put on your other hat. And on <laughs> not a Yankee hat. <laughs> right. He's wearing a Red Sox hat. Um, <laughs> so, just to, for the record, Randy Brown, 95 Fred Jackson Road, here on behalf of my mother, uh, the property owner, Fred Brown, of 39 John Mason Road. So I've been before you a few times now uh, for the disc golf course on 4151 John Mason Road. Anybody have these plans here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we have what I would consider a, a very minor modification to the site plan. Um, right now we have a shed on the property that we use for retail sales of the disc golf uh, day, day rates. Um, we have apparel that we sell. Um, so what we're looking to do is, and, and what we do is we take all the items out, we have a little pop-up tent and we sell out of the tent basically. So what we're looking to do is expand, you know, the business is doing is very, very good. Um, what we want to do is take that shed and move it to another location of the property and use that for storage of equipment. And then basically bring in a larger shed, uh, 10 by 30 shed and all of our disc soft golf sales will be inside that shed. So we're not moving things and we're not moving product in and out all day long. We're having things on the shelf and nice and orderly. So that's really the, the change. Um, the plans you have in front of you show is what's existing and then kind of where we're looking to locate the, the old shed and then where the new shed is going in the same place. There's no changes to the flow of traffic around the property. There's no modifications to the number of parking spaces. It's really just putting a larger shed where the old one is now, where the current one is now. Um, yes, process. Mm -hmm. Um, give me one second. Don't we come back? Too many recordings. So, building inspector has no issue with the proposed change and could be the shortest letter I've ever received from these folks. Um, <laughs> um, I have a letter from Diana Day Foskett, uh, attorney with uh, Jody Wallace, 
says, I'm writing on behalf of my clients, Robert and Carol Barabo, who are brothers to the New England Gifts Golf Center. We have reviewed the April 6, 2022 submission from Ms. Brown, which requests a relocation of a shed and installation of a new shed to be used for disc golf sales. The submission makes clear that there are no other site changes and no request to modify any other condition in special permit. Based on this limitation, the Barabos do not have any objection to the proposed modification to the site plan. The end. Um, so, um, any um, questions, comments from the board? Thank you, doing well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Doing very well this year. Um, Parking lot was, was full this afternoon. So, you know, I would consider this this simply be a, a, a minor modification. It doesn't require any sort of. Um, it's simply to the to the site plan itself. It's not a use issue, from what I can tell. Um, certainly, leave it to the board if they have a different opinion. But I don't see any need to impact the special permit itself. It doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's simply a, a minor site plan okay. change. Oh, I agree. Those rakes or um, holes like that. But I will open it up for any town officials or public comments if they have anything either on Zoom or in person. Nothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, what did you submit for a site? Um, is this what you submitted as a site plan? Yes. Okay. Those two. Those right. shows, yes. These two. These two documents. Oh wait, no. This is existing. The one's existing. Okay. You were proposing. Okay. All right. This is existing one is what you submitted with the um, the prior application with a special permit. Okay. Um, or at least that area of it, I should say. Okay. All right. Um, so do I hear a motion to approve um, this modification to the site plan dated April 6, 2022 for 4151 John Mason Park. Do I hear a second? I don't think you should. I will say he's in a butter. Yeah. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe not today, but yeah. Uh, Dick, you're in a butter. Did you bail out on this on this one originally? And she's did also I? your accountant. Yes, you did. All right. All right. So, um, Thank uh, you. yes. Um, do I hear a motion? So moved. All right. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Randy. Mm. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Michael Dorian. <laughs> Dave Spina. I. David Side. Site plan modification is not an approved function of the associate member. Right. Uh, special permit. Right, Douglas? I don't know if that's true, but uh, I don't know if that's true. You have to do a site plan approval for every special permit, and associate member votes on that during the course of that site special permit and site plan approval. But we're fine. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to give him <laughs> today anything to think of too thin Fair enough. All right. So um, that's all set. Appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. We need to sign a stand up. We'll do that after we we'll do that tonight. Um, all right. Town Beach Overflow Parking Area. Mr. Sutton. I'm going to step aside on that one. That's a real actual blueprint. <laughs> Look at that. There we go. Nobody brings up plants when I'm presenting. <laughs> What's wrong with plants? All right. What, what, what I got here is the, uh, the Southwick Town Beach that has very, very limited parking on it. It's got um, two handicap spots with a divider for, for access. And then there's five other spots. Uh, for parking for the town beach. Um, there's parking all along the roads and most of it's no parking. There's areas down at the bottom, but with all the controversy going on in the neighborhood, 
we thought it was best at the town beach to plan ahead just to make sure that we're in compliance and we're doing things we should. So when looking at that, there was a section that, that John had found for me that was actually laid out for parking in the wood lines across the street on Barbara, but it was never constructed. It's just basically pulling over the side of the road. Um, the cost would be substantial to, to turn that into parking lots at this point. But what we do have is we have a field in the front of the, of the, uh, the beach house, which used to be the site for the old um, leach field for the septic system. We're on sewer there now, so it's not, it's not a use. Um, I talked it over with the uh, DPW and, and talked to them about putting a parking lot and talked it over with a couple of other uh, uh, departments. And then it was found to be better to leave it grass and to open up a section of the fence and put a gate in and just use the parking on the grass there, which would probably fit about 25 cars if needed. So that gives us plenty of parking for the, for the town beach. And it's an area in which we can control. You know, there'll be tickets administered to cars as they pull in, stating that they're a member of the beach and not just randomly parking on the street or, or pulling in. Uh, the lot will be secured at night with a gate. Um, and because we want to keep it grass, so the grass will constantly heal itself, we don't want to put any stone down or anything like that because it's only going to be used a couple of months out of the year. So the rest of the time, it's just going to be grass, be mowable grass. This way, it stays just as it is. But I, you know, I went and cleared everybody else, and I thought it was best just to check, make sure we weren't doing anything to our permit, and make sure we were okay. So, I just wanted your opinion, your thoughts. Blessing. Maybe some white paint or stripes. Yeah, you line the grass or get you to come over right to the beach. I'm just in the middle of it. <laughs> yes. you know, um, you go right ahead. If that's what you feel you need to do. We will, we will accommodate you. That will be the special, I mean, special handicap. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't think it needs any change to anything. I mean, I, I don't, I guess it's I almost see it area. as similar to what they do what, on Wally's property over by Wetzel River, right? I mean, don't we, don't we allow them to do that over? Yeah, this, that's a, just an overflow parking area. Right. This is what this is pretty much going to be. Mm -hmm. right. How much distance would there be from the closest parked car to the water? 159 feet. Space for... But yes, I did measure it. To, mm -hmm. and, it was at high, it, and it was at high tide. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any uh, other questions? Okay. Um, any public questions on this issue? Yeah, there you go. Tango Hotel Lane, 45 Pine Road. If someone's going to be there issuing a ticket, are they going to have to be a town employee then? Yeah, there's, there's already a, a reception station to receive people to pay to get into the beach. At that time, they'll just simply be handed a ticket. They're not paying for parking. They're just handed a ticket to put on their dash so it signifies that they're with the beach. Okay, so it's only for Southwick residents then? That's for anybody who comes to the beach. Oh, so not like how bad it's where you it, have to be. No, okay. the town beach in Southwick is open to anybody who wants to enjoy them. If you can find a park. If you can find a park. But we're going to show have a better chance to do it. Yeah. And we do, we're going to be resanding the beach and some other things along the lines to make it prettier. Anything else? Any on Zoom? Okay. All right. Um, so I think that's all set. Um, um, what do we have for a plan? What, I mean, what year is that for a plan? Oh, that's 1922 or something? 89. Right. There's no special permit that's on file. I mean, this is the we, town land. I don't think. We do have a special permit uh, on file that was advanced. Uh, a, a curious document, nonetheless. A special permit. And this is for the, the current parking area or the proposed parking area? This is for the current configuration, although the town did not pursue construction of many of the parking spaces out there. Does this incorporate the proposed area too? Or no? The yes. At that time it's shown on the site plan, but at that time it was a uh subject a sole absorption. All right, so it will be on the site. It's incorporated so in it's here. within the same site. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, you see, you see out here, Mike, they got the right. this is the fencing area right mm -hmm. here. You just gonna open up a spot and they get the fence right here, right yeah. off of Barbara. They pull right in. Closed. Locked at night. Um, 
Remember, it's a very expensive fast sports car, but not allowed to go on second gear. <laughs> I'll do my best. Part. One second. I just want to see if there's anything we need to modify in here that would prohibit you from doing it. Otherwise, I don't really care because it's not <coughs> doing anything. Probably um, Dallas the doing this. The only reason it wasn't used in the first place is it did have the leach field in it. Sure. Uh, uh, as such, it was the subject to travel. Because you look at the plant, the parking's all around the all around it. Yeah. If it wasn't for the septic, this, this the septic probably would have been the in the, the parking lot. At least we're going to keep it rural. It's going to be natural. We're not going to worry about anything. Everybody's going to be happy. There's no standing puddles. Everything properly drains. I, I went over there in severe rain just to make sure it was fine. So here's what I'm going to suggest. We do not see anything in here that requires modification from the actual special permit. So my suggestion would be simply um, what we did with Randy's um, and an have something plan. on file that's an updated site okay. plan that has a minor modification. Um, whether we can, we have that scanner. We do. All right. So we can scan that in, we can kind of tweak it and then mm -hmm. have something we can sign uh, and uh, have that on file. So at least there's something on file that reflects parking in that area. Um, and we'll just go through this one more time. If there's any issue, we'll certainly let you know. But I don't see anything in here from my look that prohibits parking in that area. And it's just simply a matter of modifying the site plan. All right, um, I checked with, with CONCON and they were, they were perfectly fine with it. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. I said no need to see them. So do I hear a, um, well, here's the problem we have. So we'll table it until the next. I can't um, run back around and go, I? Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, you know what? No, we, we have three. Dick. We have Dick. We have three. Dick's there. That's right. It doesn't, He's not there, is there any reason you have to uh, recuse yourself? Um, um, all right. So we have three. So do I hear a motion to um, accept the minor modification to the site plan for? Um, what's the address here? Stand by. I got the GIS up right over here. What are these? I'm not going to trust that. Fourteen Beach Road. Yeah, for Fourteen Beach Road to um, indicate on the plan that there will be parking in the currently um, grassed area um, where it used to be a septic. Area. Okay. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Richard Olsinger, aye. Dave Spina, aye. All right. All I seven. win. Yep. Hey, being on this side is not that hard. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Routine, I have that. routine business. On discussion, the ranch estates. Um, This is the buffering road, right? Yes. So I'm just trying to, and I apologize in my haste for today. I did not grab my notes for my conversation with Mark Tanner. So we're gonna okay, we can end at 10 minutes tonight. We're gonna see how well my memory works, which is not well right now. But um my kids will still be away. So, you can't um, be here because you don't want to hear this. Do you have a plate answer like this? Or no? No, you don't have any of that. All right. So, just give me a minute and I'll get the specifics. Um, but here's the general sense of it, right? There is a statute that allows the board to um, uh, impose a increased bond on um, the developers of that uh, facility mm -hmm. or that development. 
Um, and so it would be in this particular case, Pinnacle Estates, I'll get the proper name, but it's Pinnacle Estates and Former developer? Yeah, that's the former developer. Who sold it to Pinnacle? It's right there. It's right there. But whatever the former one. The one so so whole farm. That was no. a permanent. Yeah. So <laughs> original developer develops it, sells off that section to Pinnacle, which is um that name? Peter Pappas. Peter Pappas. That's his so and he was going to do that section. So the law allows um a increase a motion the board to make a motion to increase the bond um, and impose it on those two developers to address this situation. Um, I what I want to find is a the correct names and b that section of the general laws which gives you the authority to do that, uh, which is what I had in my notes and I'm trying to quickly find. Um, but you know my suggestion would be um, that it would be appropriate to. To make that motion, um, and well, I think at this point, uh, what I got to see, I just got to see the language of the statute. I'm not sure we need to do the motion now, or whether we just need to vote to request um, to have Randy Brown or have DPW generally come up with a number for us um, to assess for a bond amount. Um, and we will offer it to the developer as well, or developers, they can put in what they think would be a completion amount. We'll put it in, I mean, the, the association can do it too, right? I don't care who, whoever wants to submit a number, but from our standpoint, you know, we'll ask it from DPW, submit numbers that we can then assess and, and make a motion to, to set a bond amount that will be applicable to those two developers. Um, this case, this is already in litigation. Um, involving the town, the town brought litigation against a bunch of people, try to get everybody to the table and figure it out. I was going to say, wasn't the problem that we didn't have any developers left that in, intact? There was, no, the issue was, is that the covenant was released um, mistakenly. Or I, I, I don't even want to get into how it was. I don't know. It's years ago. So, um, so, but there is a process by which a bond can be imposed for these things. And so, um, let me just get the language. Let me just give me one minute um, to make sure that I'm saying it right. I don't want there to be any issues, but the process would be to um, ask DPW, the developers, the homeowner association, whatever other interested party, they want to submit a proposed bond amount, you know, in, in, the, in the basis for it. We'll consider it at the next meeting and then make a motion to uh, propose a bond amount. So give me one second just to look at this. Um, and actually, why don't, I, why don't we... Um, so, well, anybody here can give a master plan I advisory can. committee? I've been asked to. Yep, yep. fantastic. Sure. Were you at the last meeting? I was. Awesome. Anybody ever? Yep. All right. So, yeah, the master plan committee met, uh, what was that, April 7th. Um, our focus right now is on uh, really getting things lined up for community outreach, to make people aware of the master planning process, the fact that we are doing one, the fact that we are going to be going out to everybody with a survey, try to get uh, community input. Um, we have a draft survey survey put together, um, went through that, all the questions, there's some tweaks we'll probably at the next meeting, um, hopefully get that finalized. Uh, in parallel with that, we're also putting together, I'll call it um, uh, informational material, pamphlets, posters, those kind of things through really to make sure that we can kind of communicate to the community at large, uh, kind of what we're doing and, and where we're going. Um, and then also trying to schedule a situation where members of the master planning committee will be out at various events where there's going to be a bunch of folks in town, really just to kind of spread the word, make sure everybody's looking forward to the, the survey coming out in the, I think we're shooting for like the end of May-ish timeframe. Uh, the first event we're going to shoot for will be the art show, which I believe is toward the end of April. Uh, next meeting is the 21st of April. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Dick, short-term rental subcommittee update. Well, we were going to have a meeting this evening, but it got cut off. So um, conflict of interest, I guess, conflict of meetings. We rescheduled, I believe, for May 3rd. 
Uh, we, Randy has asked for questions from the board and I, I believe some have been presented and we also have a new member and I think John has to update you on that because I don't have all the information. Oh, fantastic. So uh, let's see, Jacqueline Senez is a uh, new member, a uh, resident uh, representative on the short-term rental subcommittee. Ooh. Forward to her contributions. Participation. Okay. All right. Um, All right, minutes approval. What uh, what got circulated? I was going to ask if anybody read them. I did not distribute them. So, <laughs> so the just a placeholder for today. All right, yeah, we'll just postpone those till next time. Got it. Thank you, John. Um, a little busy. I understand. That's no, okay. Mm -hmm. Taking care of the beach thing. <laughs> we did start the discussion. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, Again, let's see if my memory actually serves me correctly, but I believe the section is eight is Mass General Laws Chapter 41, Section 81W, allows a planning board on its own motion uh, to modify, amend, or rescind its approval of a plan of a subdivision or to require a change in a plan as a condition of its retaining the status of an approved plan. Um, so that's the provision. Um, so what we'll do is, you know, I'll just make a motion tonight majority vote just to um, um, request from the interested parties as well as DPW um, suggested bond amounts for the road work that needs to be completed in the subdivision uh, with the intent to um, make a motion at the next meeting to or to discuss the bond amount and to make a motion at the next meeting to impose the bond amount on the prior um, developers, uh, the current and prior, I guess prior developers because they've both gone on a business. Um, so um, with the idea being that there's the potential to pierce the corporate bail and go after the individual. So um, do I hear a motion to um, make the request to those individuals for a bond amount? Do I hear a second? Second. For a roll call vote, Michael Doherty, aye. Rick Dorsinger, aye. Dave Spina, aye. David Sutton, aye. All right. So we will get that out. I'll, I'll work with you, John, and figure out the best way to do that. <laughs> um, I think that's it. Anything else? Just one more thing. Mr. Sutton. I make a motion to close the meeting. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. All those opposed, we don't want to hear from you. All right. <laughs>